to start over again. Welcome everyone from a cold, wet and stormy Cape Town. It is a great honor and privilege to chair this important session today with fellow colleagues and friends. The origin for this webinar was born sh shortly after we hosted the panel discussion at African Drug Policy Week in 2023. We were focusing on the outstanding work being done by women working in the harm reduction field from all over Africa. It emerged that what was needed not only was the focus on the gender-centric needs of women who use drugs, but also on the incredible service providers who are working beyond standard harm reduction practice of OAT and needle and syringe provision, but to include and highlight other community-based risk mitigation services, for example, linkage to sexual health care, strengthening perinatal harm reduction, addressing gender-based violence, and also capacitating key stakeholders that we work alongside, for example, law enforcement. Today, we kickstart our first of four webinars where we're looking at gender-centric harm reduction in South Africa. Going forward, we will host quarterly webinars that will also focus on East, West, and Northern Africa, so as to share lessons, overcome challenges, and look at how we can collaboratively and contextually unite on bettering the lives of African women while still respecting and upholding traditional and cultural practices. In addition to shining a spotlight on some of the amazing work being done in South Africa, we are also going to hear from Aura. She is the founding director for Medicineros, an organization focused specifically on addressing sheltered harm reduction services for women in Barcelona. Aura will share her passion and explore some of the ways in which their services have helped shape best practice models for women who use drugs all around the world. We will also be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So may I please ask that participants joining us today save their questions or post them in the Q&A box. Um, the moderators will go through that and then we will address them either in the chats or uh, at the end when we have our discussion time. So without any further delays, welcome everybody again. Um, I'd like to also thank HRI for hosting it, us today where we're giving us the platform to share and speak um, and putting Africa on the map. Um, and I would like to kick off today by introducing our first speaker. She is going to share for us as her personal perspective as a woman who uses drugs from rural South Africa. Welcome Karen Matthews, a former community healthcare worker. She has been elected as the network lead for Genadendal in the outlying region of the Overberg in the Western Cape. Um, this marks the first ever establishment for their region, resulting from a project delivered by Stan. We've got Stacy on the panel, we'll hear from her later. Um, Karen is recognized for her unwavering dedication and commitment to sustaining and developing the support work despite challenges posed by limited resources in the area in which she lives. Karen, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, I didn't do any notes, so I'm just going to speak. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a pleasure for me being a network leader for this group um and for the time that i've been with with stand um i must say first of all um i didn't have any self-confidence me myself um and the group really helped me to give myself confidence a boost um i was really shy to speak and to even interact in the community um because of the stigma and as Julie and Stacey them as teachers um, to stand for ourselves and to be able to stand on, on our own feet to take what is ours and make use of it for me as group leader I've put it um, in the group so that we can actually Excuse me, got a call, got to put it off. Yeah, so um, it's been an honor so far and about the stigma that has come up. <clears throat> yeah, in Genadendal itself, it's been really, really hard for us as, as ladies who use drugs to be able to go outside and 
just show up for issues out there or even go look for a job or something. And after we've met um, this group, we've participated and I think all of us um, basically got some boost in the self-confidence. Mm -hmm. We've got that, mm, sorry, the score, just don't want to stop now. So it's been much, much better for us um, to even go out in the society, in our community, um, to be able to broadcast, um, stand, to tell them about us, what we have learned and how um, it feels for us um, as women who use as drugs to be seen as normal human beings in the community. And um, yeah, I must say, even for the summer that has passed, some work has come up, seasonal work here in Genarendal, as we you know, basic, almost like a farm. We have to go work on farms or do house cleaning and, and things like that. I think um, some of us really have some confidence um, to even went out and to go do some work on the farms. With the police, clinics and all of that, I see all of the ladies, most of the ladies basically, attend um, clinics nowadays, regular checkups as, as we spoke. And we've got a better understanding with our health care sector and with the police also, because um, so far I've, I've never um, even got any complaints about um, our ladies that has trouble with police or have trouble with hospitals or clinics visits, except Tiffany, which I helped like a few, I think a month ago, I helped her again to get into hospital because she was really sick, but everything went well. So for that, I can just say um, thank you for, for Julie and Stacey them. Um, for giving us that upliftment. And yeah, it's just the fact that we and in Genarendal, um, we're not on the platform that much like the other groups have because we're not financially like um, stable enough to go on and do our own thing. But so far, so good. And I appreciate it. I'm, I'm really glad um, to be the group leader of... of this group, um, Genarendal Network, and to have my team leaders. Um, they also always there for support and we support each other. And I must say again, thank you, Jules, and thank you, Stacey, for giving us that opportunity. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh Thank you so much, Karen, for sharing your insights and a little touch on your personal journey. I know it takes great courage to be vulnerable in front of people you don't know, and you're speaking to potentially 300 people. So I'm really hoping that your little insight allows those who have joined us today um, a little glimpse into why we are all so passionate about doing the work that we all do. Um, one of the things Karen neglected to mention was the high rates of gender-based violence experienced in uh, the rural areas where she stays. Um, and we know that uh, there is a lot of work that still needs to happen out there and in many other rural regions of South Africa. So, Karen, thank you again for sharing with us today. Thank you. Yachi, who will be sharing with you more on our concept note for these webinars and the formation of the HER movement, focusing on harm reduction services that are gender-centric and inclusive. Kel has a background in clinical psychology. Her career spans over nine years, during which she has dedicated herself to addressing critical issues such as women and children's welfare, advocacy, psychosocial support, and HIV prevention amongst key populations. Kelvanya served as project manager, overseeing one of the pioneering harm reduction programs in South Africa. Um, this was during COVID as well, a difficult time. Um, before she joined NACOSA as the program specialist, uh, where she's responsible for global fund program implementation for people who use drugs in eight districts across South Africa. Kalvanya's passion for human rights underscores her commitment to fostering inclusive and effective 
interventions that prioritize well-being and dignity of all individuals. Over to you, Kalpanya. Thank you so much, Jules. Good afternoon, colleagues. And thank you, Karen, for sharing your story with us. Um, I'm going to cover just uh, the concept note around how we came about <clears throat> starting the African Woman in Harm Reduction. And basically, the African Woman in Harm Reduction uh, platform will serve for discussing, collaborating, learning, and sharing resources for African women involved in harm reduction. It is a group that will emphasize the importance of establishing a dedicated platform for women, for African women in harm reduction, which aims to tackle an array of problems we face, which will also aim to address the unique challenges faced by women in this field, as well as the significant issues encountered by women who use drugs and the greater extent rationalized women who are characterized as having diverged from traditional ideas of womanhood as, as a result of drug user stigma and the, and the intersections of gender and class-based racist stereotypes. This platform will not only highlight and introduce best practices, evidence-based programs, and initiatives tailored and implemented within an African context. By breaking cultural norms and eradicating the stigma associated with drug use, which is essential in providing effective harm reduction services for women, with a primary emphasis on offering support and assistance to individuals struggling with substance use disorders. We pay particular focus on young people and their pivotal role in harm reduction efforts and interventions that should be targeted towards educating, empowering our communities. We will also focus on a collaborative advocacy, resource allocation and funding opportunities what African women in harm reduction and, will, and also emphasize the differences between traditional and global North harm reduction and women specific harm reduction to ensure both are recognized and adequately supported. Lastly, this platform is essential for addressing the demographic unique challenges and needs of women who use drugs through collaboration, advocacy, uh, resource sharing, so that we can work towards effectively and inclusively uh, offering harm reduction services for women of Africa. Thanks, Jules. Well, thank you so much, Galvanya. Um, uh, next, we are going to hear from Dema Katso. Dee is the youngest stalwart in our harm reduction panel today and a member of the HER movement. Uh, Dee will be sharing on the incredible work that's been done by community-orientated care in Gauteng. Um, they operate in Chwani um, and they are cover. I think they've got 13 sites. I stand to be corrected, but I'm sure we'll hear more from Dee. And they really do offer inclusive harm reduction services. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, just a little bit of background. Dee is a clinical associate in the Community Orientated Substance Use Program since its inception in 2016. She holds a clinical medical practice, a postgrad degree in psychology. She is currently leading the capability training department for COSA. She oversees all drug and substance use, including harm reduction training and education for staff, communities, and relevant stakeholders across programs managed by the COSA Care Research Unit at the University of Pretoria. She has also developed and ran national workshops and trained healthcare professionals, community health workers, and relevant community members in harm reduction. During this time, she has co-authored and published an article on developments in this field. Demokatsu has a passion for people-centered care and strides, sorry, strives to advocate for quality, person-centered approaches to community health. Demokatsu, we are very grateful to have our little mighty mouse with us today. Um, and yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. Over to you, thank you. Dee, I think you're muted. Ah, oh, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you so much, Julie. And hello to everyone, all the attendees. Is my presentation visible? Thanks, Kels. Um, so I'm Dima Katonanyane from the Community Oriented Substance Use Program that started in 2016. 
the program is based on the community oriented primary care service, which looks at how do we bring healthcare service more into communities and into households, uh, being patient centered, but also looking at all of the dynamics that brings about communities, because this is where people do life. This is where people design how they're going to survive life and experience all of life with all of its ups and downs. And that's where the key health can be achieved. Uh, so ultimately, this is where we bring public health and clinical care into household settings. Now, where COPC and harm reduction made, it resulted in the creation or the development of the Community Oriented Substance Use Program, which currently is within the city of Tuan. This is a program by, by the municipality, one of the first funded municipal programs that's looking towards providing service towards people who use substances. Um, and it's in great collaboration with the University of Victoria and other stakeholders. So ultimately is looking at providing care in the full spectrum of a human experience, you know, from in utero to as we get old. And all of the factors that play around in terms of the risk factors someone might experience in the initiation and towards problematic substance use or chaotic use, and all of the protective factors that they would experience within their communities. Um, so the services in that end, it being a COPC and harm reduction, the key point was how do we got sites and intervention to be based inside communities, where there's some sites that are in churches or some in clinics and all of these spaces providing uh, holistic care. So these are some of the site activities that clients can receive from your harm reduction um, package to other psychosocial interventions, including things like maybe support groups where uh, people experiencing some uh, chaotic or problematic substance use can collaborate, not just with their family members, but also with their larger community. And this is when the overall community plays a role. How do we get them? Because uh, the, the concept of re rehabilitation being an individual problem, this is now moving towards how do you, all of us get to a point where we are facing and really dealing with the real issues. So this afforded us to look at local community services from capacitation to collaborating with stakeholders, home visits, and all the other elements that play a role in it. And this gives us a, such a unique opportunity to collaborate even at a larger scale, collaborate with overall community members, start community dialogue around the schools, clinics, and workplace outreach, and also have research based and role in this. Um, when someone would go to a COSAP site, what they would find in terms of the team is firstly, and very importantly, is peer educators who form such a unique link between uh, the site staff and the client themselves. So they, they are great internet with that. And we have community health care workers who we name as care coordinators. They also assist in linking us with the overall community as this is where they are based. We have social workers, clinical associates, and clinical doctors, social workers providing psychosocial interventions at an individual level, but also at a family level. And community uh, interventions can happen there. And clinical associates, in partnership and collaboration with medical doctors, providing healthcare service that is very needed for a marginalized community. Um, so we've done a few studies to check what is happening, what's the impact. And one of them was to look at in terms of the people we are collaborating with, what's their perception of the work that has been done. And we found favorable outcomes in terms of people who are very familiar with what COTSAP does. They affirmed that there's an improved in wellness, improved in family relation, um, improved in overall health, and improvement in terms of awareness around services that can be provided and improvement in terms of how people approach and even collaborate with people who use substances. Um, so with all of these impacts that we have noted through this study, positive changes and all that, the question still lies. And this is why such an intervention as a woman in hand reduction what's happening here gives us to question 
in terms of people reached and how much females are being reached in that stance. When, when we looked at um, the past year financial return, financial year, it was that in terms of overall people reach females or women accounted for, this woman and trans woman accounted for 24% of the overall people reached. And this is where, as COSAP is evolving and figuring and getting information to feedback in terms of what more services can we do. We, we made it accessible in terms of proximity, but what other barriers are there in responding to this is putting us in a way we now start in conversation to say, okay, what else do we need to do to improve service? Or what else do we need to do to ensure that we are reaching women in this day? But I'll be remiss if I don't mention some of the work that has been done by women at the front line of substance use from starting campaigns around gender-based violence that are specifically experienced by women who use drugs and not just them, but also getting them to be supported by fellow females, fellow women around the communities, their mothers to share in their stories and that to understand what's happening. Uh, taking pride in providing nutrition, um, starting book clubs, uh, one of our female, uh, Michelle starting a book club and championing that initiative, um, having different groups of uh, our staff taking on and going to communities and championing this intervention, doing yoga, engaging with people, bringing back that uh, zeal for life for women who use substances by women who, who are working in this field, uh, reaffirming people. We're having contemplation groups that are happening at households uh, where people leave and aggregate, where we also creating opportunities to give clothing and affirm a sense of dignity and then all of these things. And I want to just honor all the women that work with us in this space for all of the effort and initiative that goes towards that I see you as I'm a woman, I also see you and I recognize your space in this world and in our lives and getting to influence each other positively. So I thank you all the ladies and women within the course of the book. I honor you for your effort and I'm thankful for this uh, initiative because it will keep us accountable, will keep us in check and will also guide us in terms of what more do we need to bring in this space at a community level to ensure a safer and equal space for everyone involved. Thank you. Well, wow. what more can we say? Thank you so much for that. Um, I think what COFSAP is representing here is at the heart of harm reduction, what we're seeing from your slides, where the focus is not just on numbers or data, but it's actually on people, where we're looking at principles of harm reduction, um, on compassionate approaches to helping the most vulnerable people. So thank you so much for, for me, also for all the work that COSAP are doing, and I think I speak on behalf of everybody in the webinar. Um, Thank you for reaching the most vulnerable. And on that note, we now hand over to our Global North representative, Aura. Um, Aura is going to share with us some best practice concepts and the, about the incredible work that has been done by Metzineros in Barcelona. Aura is an anthropologist and has a master's degree in criminology and sociology of the penal system. Currently, she is working on her PhD in medical anthropology. She is the founder director of Metzineros, the first non-governmental cooperative dedicated to develop sheltered environments for women and diverse gender people who use drugs, surviving violence and multiple situations of vulnerability. She is also the international advisor on drug policy, harm reduction, human rights and gender mainstream, combining research with design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of drug policies, programs and services. Not only has Aura worked in Spain, she's worked in USA, Canada, Colombia, Costa Rica, and many other places around Europe. She is certainly an expert in her field. Uh, over to you, Aura. Thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen. And thank you so much for this invitation. It's, I am learning a lot. I'm taking notes about this name of a care coordinator that I will install it. Uh, for sure, and thank you, Karen, for for uh, your beautiful uh, sharing presentation and 
how important it is and the network of African women. Thank you so much for that. And what a lesson. Um, yeah, Medzineras comes like, I have to recognize the privilege that we have in Europe. Of course, everything that I am saying comes from this privilege, like uh, Barcelona was the city with the higher rates of overdose, uh, uh, deaths between the ages of 15 and 35 years old in the in the 80s, and also of uh, the other. Um, also, I, 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 AIDS was a, a big uh, issue. We were also one of the the places in Europe with higher rates. Also, but Catalonia and not Spain. Uh, had this amazing or this commitment that all the political parties agree to invest on harm reduction and not use harm reduction as a weapon, as a political weapon. And it was crucial to develop a network of care that includes harm reduction from the beginning, also treatment, also prevention, et cetera, et cetera, and research. No, and all of this come from an amazing group of researchers that was composed by doctors, people who use drugs, um, just people from the academia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was called the group Oigia, and from then they were around the world looking for solutions, pragmatical solutions that the government really listened about that. Then it was amazing because now we have this amazing network that includes uh, methadone uh, maintenance programs, social cannabis clubs needle exchange programs and since uh, 1997 drug checking services uh, since 2003 supervisor consumption rooms um, and since 2017 uh, medzineras but having called this amazing network of care we noticed in 2016 that uh, when we began with the network of women who use drugs we noticed that women and gender non-conforming people were not arriving, not just to the harm reduction services, but also to the standardized networks of support. Like, yeah, we have all the, um, all the support that we can imagine, but women are not arriving there. Not to the networks uh, against violence against women, not to the networks for mental health, not to the services for housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They were excluding. Can we have one of these amazing systems, no? And also, we saw a limit with the harm reduction. If we don't go to the structural causes of, uh, of violence and exclusion, what we are doing when we are just looking at the drugs is to chronify the situation of exclusion and vulnerability. Then the people is not dying because I AIDS. It means the harm reduction was crucial in the 80s. Uh, the people is not dying because, um, because uh, overdose, but they are dying 15 years younger than the rest of the population or around, I don't have the exact data, but because they are living in the streets, because they don't have mental health issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then harm reduction was amazing how was implemented at a strategy, but the perspective of harm reduction, bringing harm reduction to all these networks of support was not there. And also was really isolated from the community. And this is what Medzineras uh, tried to do. And not Medzineras, Medzineras was the fruit of the meetings during more than a year or practically two years of the Chadut, that was the, chat, the network of women who use drugs and looking at each other and trying to dream what we wanted to do. And when we had the money, then we began to build um, what we wanted to do. And this is Medzineras is a, a non-profit cooperative that uh, try to develop safer space and, uh, and environments of shelter for women. I don't want to go to all the um, all the principles that we have, but as you can see, like um, we try to think from this perspective that is holistic, but also really based on the needs, individual needs, um, and also really bringing this community and economy solidarity based economy perspective into. Uh, harm reduction and services that, from our perspectives, were really institutionalized and really medicalized. No, 
and far away from what the people knew. When you, and also not focus on drugs, because we are not talking about drugs. Everybody uses drugs and all the women uses drugs. The difference is if you go to the bar, if you go to the doctor, if you go to the pharmacy, or if you have to go to an illegal market that doesn't provide you with that. Then what happens when you don't put drugs in the center that you see when the drugs become a problem and they are not the drugs that become a problem is what we can see is that 100% of the women that come to Medzineras, and we are talking about 529 women, we are not talking about two or four or three. Um, the, what you see is that they survive a situation of violence, they just sleep in the streets. They are uh, handling the, the transfer of the loss of custody of their kids. They are doing sex work or sex for survival. They are uh, facing uh, homeless, mental health issues. Then what we wanted to put is, of course, a social space where the women and the uh, gender non-conforming people are in the center, when everybody has the right to define their own uh, process of uh, well-being, whatever it means, physical, psychological, uh, psychologist. Let me know if I'm going out of time, please, because I, I forgot to see that, that time. We try to reduce the barriers to other services because what we see is that it's not important to open just services for women. This is important because they're going to arrive there. But if we don't have any place that they can go after that, we cannot take care of everybody, of everything. And this is one of the limits of the harm reduction, that because they accept everybody and they go where the people are at, they are taking care of all the rest of the network, where all the, the people that doesn't arrive to the rest of the networks. No, then we begin to be super blocked on that. No, then super important to work to make sure that the, these other networks are sending and unincorporating the harm reduction perspective to them. And of course, they have to be in the center and it doesn't mean always that the women who use drugs have to be in all the meetings, but we need to guarantee how their voices and their needs are really, um, are really taken into account in the plans, in the politics, et cetera, et cetera, because not always these places are safe places for them then we need to make sure when we are um, including people in the process and especially people that never talk in public, never was in, a, in political uh, arenas, knows exactly what they are doing, what are is doing with their images, with their goals, et cetera, et cetera. Then also making sure that it's not just the presence, but the presence is safe and is significant, no? Uh, and we are part of the social movements and the community. Uh, we love to go to the streets, but I don't gonna go deep on that. We do that with a lot of activities. We have a space where we provide, where there are a safer space to use all kinds of drugs, whatever it is. They have beds to rest in the bed. Don't think that we have a building. We have a double garage. It's super small, the place, but we do everything there. Um, a lot of um, workshops like Cosmetica, uh, and we organize, we invite to have paella to all the neighbors every Friday, then you have to win the neighbors with the stomach. It's amazing to do it like that, but I don't want to show you that because I learned that from you. Yes. And um, now we have another project that is for the legal support of, of the women that is called Casa Marian. And I am finishing. We do a lot of monitoring, planning, and evaluation, but with new metrics, defining new metrics, because it's really important to know that what we are doing is okay and what we are doing no. I don't want to go there, but go to the web, web page and see the materials that we have. Also, UNODC uh, consider as a good practice, then they, they did a good job <laughs> systematizing what we are doing. Uh, and here you can follow up all the work that we are doing and my email and whatever. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Aura. I think we could have dedicated a full hour to just listening to the incredible work that Metzineros has done. Um, I encourage everybody to have a look at their social pages, um, look at their website, follow the work that they're doing. It's really inspirational, particularly for women and gender diverse people. Um, we have, uh, you know, I think even though we're living on different continents and we have different contexts and social issues, 
I think we are united in working and visualizing women in harm reduction and trying to mitigate the risk to their lives and their loved ones. And I think a lot of the challenges that are faced um, in Europe are also faced by women here in Africa. So, Aura, right, thank you. We really do appreciate your time in joining us on the webinar today. Um, and yeah, I encourage, as I say, everybody to go have a look at the incredible work that they're doing. Thank you so much. And what, <laughs> thank you. One of the things that, that was mentioned uh, by Aura was the need for data and research. And next, we are going to hear from Daniela Huemann. Um, she's going to share with us on some of the gender centric research she's been carried out in Kauteng. Um, Daniela is a clinical associate and associate lecturer in the Division of Clinical Associates. She holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Wits in clinical medical practice, a postgrad diploma in addictions care, and an MPhil in family medicine from Stellenbosch University. She has a love for teaching and passion in community work, which started in 2018 when she taught public health to community healthcare workers. Um, Daniela hopes that all her endeavors in both her personal and academic life will allow her to be an advocate for the integration of comprehensive addiction care services into primary health care systems and child safeguarding in South Africa. Furthermore, she wants to contribute to the development of interventions and policies that are evidence-based, culturally appropriate, accessible to all, and anticipate risks to public health. Over to you, Daniela. We're looking forward to hearing about your research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, I must apologize. We're having some network issues. Um, so I do hope I'm clear for the time that I've been allocated. Um, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Um, and I think, firstly, I have to mention, the study came about with um, the idea that we, we started COSUP and we, we really were... Um, you know, inspired by the harm reduction for philosophy, but I think in also trying to address um, the importance of its culture within the health sciences space, it was very important to collect data to make sure that we're ensuring patient safety as much as we might feel like our intervention is the right thing. Um, and I think for me personally, it came through the fact that I was seeing women using OST and I was an inexperienced professional at the time because I was you know, only now um, doing my postgrad um, in addiction care. And I didn't know that some of the ladies got pregnant. And even then I got even more flustered. What is it? Um, care. So um, my slides don't seem to be moving. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so from this table, all I just wanted to highlight here is that Africa, um, our data in terms of the World Drug Report um, is unfortunately limited close to null. So if you look for Southern Africa, there hasn't been any data points. Um, and what's clear, it's the concerning lack of prevalence data for our region. Um, so, you know, the it's very difficult for us to even understand the population estimates because it could be greater. But what we can turn to is at least looking at the data collected from treatment sites. So in our country, we do have the South African Community Epidemiology Network on drug use, and they release um, reports quite often of South Africans who enrolled for inpatient substance use treatment. Um, and what under the age of 20, cannabis was actually the primary substance of choice, followed by methamphetamine or heroin. And a concerning finding within this report, um, considering HIV prevalence in sub-Saharan sub Africa, is the increase in people who, who inject drugs. Um, other um, studies that within Swane that looked at hepatitis, um, um, also picked up um, and a few and another qu qualitative study that was also done in Swane, picked up picked up on that women who use drugs are vulnerable population facing higher HIV rates, intimate partner violence, and limited access to gender sensitive interventions. So 
Democrats are presented on, on COSAP model, um, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But what I wanted to highlight is that South Africa is one of five African countries that provides community-based OST. Um, within the COSAP model, um, we try to provide a comprehensive harm reduction service. However, the challenges do persist, you know, in understanding the utilization patterns of the harm reduction uh, program. Um, and um, similar to you, Aura, we also found that it was difficult recruiting women who use drugs to participate, um, mostly in studies around OST retention um, or looking at the prevalence of HIV and hepatitis C. Um, so further research is needed. Um, and what we could pick up is that the you know underrepresentation of women in drug dependent treatment um, could possibly tell us about the actual services. Um, so we could look at us struggling to recruit could have um, some indication as to the services we're bringing. So that that came to pretty much the aim of um, the study was let's find out the characteristics of of these women that are accessing opioid substitution therapy. Um, so we did a descriptive observational study. So we took um, the electronic um, database for OST and we looked at paper-based files um, and we looked at um, these uh, uh, set variables that were collected um, by, by the program. Um, and we wanted to assess what these, the factors associated with retention. Um, and so we looked at assist scores um, and we also looked at where the treatment um, services were being provided. So what we found out were participants were unemployed, mostly falling with 20 to 29 years of age, accessing services from community-based facilities. Um, one in three women had experienced intimate partner violence and 19% were pregnant whilst on OST. Uh, women discontinued therapy for various reasons, uh, with loss to follow-up being at 43.6%, returning to substance use being at 12.9%. Um, and then retention on OST, we noticed uh, some association with age of initiation, um, knowledge of HIV status, um, which we could think is perhaps once finding one once one finds out the HIV status, um, there's sort of that psychological shift of taking um, sort of steps towards improving their health, and so the HIV status sort of draws them to then seeking out OST so that they can get onto the AR, ART system and be compliant um, with that treatment, um, as well as um, even though that wasn't initial concept of addressing communicable diseases, but over the time partnerships with, for example, VITS RHI um, and trying to bring in HIV treatment within the COSAP model um, through partnerships with other organizations could have possibly assisted. Unfortunately, that wasn't something we analyzed in the study. Um, and then the daily methadone dose of more than 40 milligrams um, was found to be what helped with retention. So in summary, uh, our, our study highlights the vulnerability of women in the context of substance use and retention and OST. And we observe the importance of, um, interestingly, a higher age at OST initiation, um, knowing one's HIV status and a higher total assist score and adequate methadone dosing and promoting retention. Um, but what we want to emphasize is that this is just quantitative data. So what would really help is perhaps um, you know, exploring more the qualitative um, uh, uh, data around this particular uh, um, uh, um, topic, as well as uh, comprehensive interventions um, in, redu in harm reduction programs um, in, in uh, uh, addressing some of these crucial um, factors that we found. Um, one limitation I do want to then highlight is that this doesn't typify all the women who use drugs because um, we looked at those that were on OST and sometimes there's women who are collecting um, NSP so th that are enrolled in the needle syringe program. And so those women, unfortunately, were not surveyed. Um, as well as we need to take into consideration the facility type on recruitment and management. Um, those could have also um, 
that you know further research is needed to say you know the the way certain sites recruit um, because some of our sites are integrated into a clinic others are in a hospital um, based setting others are in NGOs um, so if those possibly could have had an influence but I'm going to quickly get to the so what the so what here for me um, goes to programs should be prioritizing the need to address sexual reproductive of health rights of women who use drugs more broadly um, to reduce the incidence of loss to follow up uh, treatment providers should have um, enhanced engagement and and have follow-up stra strategies i do feel one place to start is the training of the workforce and perhaps most importantly um, the training at a university or undergraduate um, level. So if we're expecting people, because we have these policy reforms, for example, in our HIV TB STI um, policy document, but um, we need to start making sure that there are there is training that's happening for the community healthcare workers whilst they're in their college years, um, the medical professionals, um, and actually all uh, a staff within that model. So whilst we can catch them in the treatment services, but the the early um, the the young people that are in training that will then go into these professions also need to be conscientized um, about the intersectionality um, of these uh, socioeconomic um, factors that that affect uh, women who use drugs, um, and that we also look at strategies around economic empowerment, um, not only looking at a comprehensive healthcare service, um, and have targeted approaches that are informed by women who use drugs. And I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, again, I think we could have spent ages looking at this data and analyzing it further, but I really do appreciate your time and in joining us today and sharing on your research that you've done. Some very interesting statistics there. Um, yeah, and I think we are pushed for time, so I'm going to rush on. Um, we're going to be going into the discussion phase and the q and A. I'm going to invite Pauline Daniels. Um, I, she doesn't need much introduction. I think everybody knows her from HRI to take over the Q&A session from me. Colleen, um, for those that don't know, she is the Acting Executive Director and Public Health Lead at Harm Reduction International. She has 25 years of work experience in HIV, AIDS, TB, uh, gender, human rights, and challenging operational environments, harm reduction, community system strengthening, working to deliver access to essential health services. She has worked in programs globally and has lived and worked in Australia, Kenya, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Thailand, Kingdom of Tonga, and the USA. Colleen has worked in a variety of settings, including the Stop TB Partnership, um, which was UNOPS, World Health Organizations, Treatment Action Group, Health, or Health Action International, and the Tongan and Australian Government Departments of Immigration and AusAid. Um, we're also very proud to say that Colleen is South African or she hails from South Africa. So wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you for your ongoing support. And over to you now for the Q&A and discussion points. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all so much for the presentations. It has been extraordinarily um, eye-opening and uh, I, I think raising a lot of questions that uh, providing answers to a lot of questions that many of us have. And I think one point I'd like to make is the fact that, you know, there are hundreds of millions of people who use drugs around the world. There are some people who have a substance use issue, but harm reduction services should be available for anybody who wants them. Um, and when I talk to women around the world and, you know, and I start talking about harm reduction services and I say, what do you need? And most of them don't ever talk about opioid agonist therapy or needle and syringe programs. The first things I hear will be nutrition. We need food. I need housing. Um, I need a job. I need to know my kids are taken care of. I need to be safe. Um, I am in an unsafe environment in my household. I'm experiencing domestic violence. Um, the last thing I hear about is what we consider core biomedical harm reduction approaches like needle and syringe programs, naloxone, and opioid agonist therapy. And so I'm hoping that with these sessions and with these platforms we're trying to pull together that we can start having these discussions about how we shift A, our perspective around harm reduction and what services are delivered, and B, move away from a biomedical approach 
And, you know, initially I talked about health hubs and actually Aura, we were sitting in a restaurant one day, just uh, coincidentally in, in Bogota in Colombia. And she said, no, 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 no. You need to talk about well-being hubs because we're talking about the well-being of, of people. And I think what Daniela and, and Dima were, and, and Karen were talking about were community well-being programs. Um, because you cannot be alone anymore in our environments. We are part of a community, and so we need to have a community response. So on that note, there are a lot of questions. Woo, y'all putting a lot of questions in here, and I'm getting um, messages from um, my colleagues saying, you only have a few minutes. So um, I am going to just go into uh, some of these right now. Um, anonymous attendee said, is re sexual reproductive health rights part of the services offered? And I know Aura, yes, and uh, Stacy, yes, in those programs. Um, and what we could do is maybe pr put some links in the chat for where people can access information. And I've put some in there already. Um, oh my goodness, this is my menopause, can't read without reading glasses now, so ridiculous. Um, aging and womanhood is something else. And that's another thing we don't talk about in harm reduction for women is women who are going through perimenopause and menopause who may actually be misdiagnosed by medical services because our menopause symptoms can look like we're, you know, having many other things sometimes. But this question is for COSA. What is a common issue that drives women to use drugs? Which areas do you implement your program at Tishwane? I'm going to ask you to answer the second question because I don't think we need to know why people use drugs. We use drugs because it's good. We use drugs because we need to, whatever the reason is. Um, so I'd like to maybe ask you to, to, to stick to the second part of that question, if you don't mind. Uh, Dima. Thanks, Colleen. Um, so we are within four regions in the city of Tuani, and I will ensure that I put up the pamphlet that has site address and telephone numbers on it. So, yeah. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, Aura, we have a question from Yolande Jordan, and uh, specifically on the topic of your program around the cannabis as a harm reduction tool. Um, she, I, I don't know if you can read the question, but she says, I agree that cannabis can be very effective as a harm reduction many, measure for many women and non-conforming gender people. However, in the booklet, many benefits of cannabis, cannabis are emphasized, and the one page where responsible use of cannabis is implied seems objective. Um, her question is, I am curious whether the organization recognizes the potential harm of cannabis. Yes, in fact, uh, one of the, this is the methodology that we use with medicineras in general, but this material really uh, is the same. Like we began to see how the women that comes to medicineras were using cannabis. And of course, like there is a page that also explains the, the, cons, the negative impact. But what we saw is that uh, they were using cannabis for a lot of reasons. We, we don't think that the people use dr any drugs just because the harms they use it because it's something that then we were interested of what are the risks and what are the the yeah the non desired um symptoms but especially why they were using that because if we know why and there is a problem we also know what we have to work with no and what we need to but uh, after having all this information collected we didn't filter that. We just arrived to have all the testimonies and the, the information was repeated. We went to the scientific community and we went to talk, for example, with Jose Carlos Bozo, who is the scientific director of ICRs, no? and we went to talk with Mujeres Cannabicas, women who use cannabis, uh, and we went to talk with the experts of cannabis, scientific community, and we asked if the, what the women were explaining to us was real or not and they say that was real and not just that but they appointed to the different articles scientific articles that say what the women already said and it was amazing because it was everything that the women said was in some scientific article then but was like totally dispersed the information and also in a language that nobody gonna read or sorry not nobody but not a lot of people gonna read 
and don't understand. Then what we did is like to corroborate that and put the same information in a way that women can read, not just the women, but everybody can read it and can understand it. But with the knowledge of the scientific community on the top of the knowledge of the women, because what we saw is that everything that the women say was real. And this is the harm reduction. And also asking if something was um, not there. And they were like, no, the most important information is right there. And we come back with this material to the women, and this is what you see. Thank you so much. Um, Ruth Bergen, question for Daniela and Dima. Are women who are on opioid um, agonist therapy required uh, are women who are opioid dependent required to be on opioid agonist therapy in order to access ARVs in the COSUP sites? Daniela, do you want to take that? Um, so that was not the case, um, not just only for women, but for all COSUP, um, uh, COSUP service users. Um, so OST is not a prerequisite. Um, and hence, that's why I, I, I indicated that um, our, we cannot generalize um, because there's women who weren't on OST um, that obviously weren't su surveyed. Um, and so we do have women who access other harm reduction services and access services, um, non-harm reduction services. Um, so I, I'm just going to go on, on the clinic, um, which I was in in Irsiris. Um, The woman could access the services from around the clinic, from COSAP, as well as the, the government clinic, without having to be on, on, on OST. Um, also remember, not all... Um, also in our CASA program, we are not only um, providing services to people who use opioids. So there are people who use methamphetamine, cannabis, they use other drugs that access CASA services. So it's not to say that we only run services for people who use opioids. Um, Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Jesse Camus says people using drugs are sometimes perceived or are, are perceived as failures and have caused distress to families. During reintegration to family members, what challenges have you faced? Would anyone like to take that one? I think on that, I'd just like to say, first of all, that I'd like to change the way we think about that. Um, because people who use drugs, uh, the perception of people who use drugs and the st stigma and discrimination that's out there is something we have to change with our narratives and the words that we use um, and the terminology that we use when we're talking about people who use drugs. Um, because at the end of the day, we are all people who use drugs in some way, shape or form. Um, it's just that our governments have determined some of them are okay and some of them are not. And that's not even based in any sort of evidence. So I think, you know, that's one of the things where I would love for all of us, as we're talking about this, where we're talking about the well-being of women um, and girls and trans and gender diverse people, we're actually talking about um, the issues that we can address in terms of how our communities can respond, how we can come together to respond. So, um, but if anyone else would like to jump in, please do. Um, I'd like to jump in, Colleen. I think what you said is so spot on. When it comes to drugs, the narrative, you have to be fear responsive. If you're not responding from fear, you're not doing enough, you're not doing sufficient. And I found that family members, once they are released from that panic and wanting to be fearful, when they are free to love their family members. They are free to create even their own boundaries with their family members and have a space to say, I still love this human being regardless of everything that we've experienced and reconnect with them. So it's all of what we have inherited has created such a panic and family members don't know how to relate anymore because the only thing they have been taught, the only thing that they know at the current moment is that if I'm not fearful, I'm not responding with enough intensity, and that needs to change. Thank you. I would love to, to add a little bit. Yeah, I totally agree uh, with what has been said. And 
yeah, we are not talking about the problem related with drug. We are talking about the problem related with prohibition and stigma and discrimination, no? And I think that for me, this was clear. Like I come from a place that I had the liberty and I was educated on harm reduction. Like my drug, my, no? Like I had the information, I can access to analyze the drugs. I do, do my drugs with my community and with the people that I love and cares for me, then all of these are harm reduction strategies that most of the people is using in their daily life to avoid the problems. And when we see the problems, they are not related with drug use. It's like, of course, some kind of drug use is not helping. If I have to go to a flat that is illegal, that exposed me in front of the police, of course, I'm going to have more problems related with drugs. And if I don't have access to work, because of course I'm going to have to steal or to rob something or to make money in an illegitimate way. But problems are others. And drugs are something that can be a problem or not. It's the same. If you know how to drive, you don't going to have accidents, but maybe you're going to have an accident because other people doesn't know or because the signals, the sign was not there or because you didn't put the belly, whatever. Then, but we don't forbid that for that. And this information, the quality of the, 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 the quality of the networks of care is what is crucial. And we see when, 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 when you were saying it's community, of course it's community, no? And sorry. Sorry, may I add, if I may, I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> um, yes, please go ahead, Danielle. Um, Karen, uh, can I ask you to mute your, your phone, please? I'm thinking about information and sorry, I'm just thinking about previous um, work where I've experienced children as researchers and and I and, and I think for me I, I I'm I'm thinking about you know co-creating new knowledge and and developing um, ways in which we could work together and and because um, I think there might be some academics here but I think there's an importance of about, about understanding the power dynamics inherent in in academia research and information and you know who what what information is considered uh, credible you know there's here's historical political and social contexts um, that have sort of perpetuated um, our language um, what we consider to be um, sound uh, um, policies as 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 well. So for me, I'm I'm hoping, I'm I'm really hoping to see that where knowledge is 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 created, and I'm gonna talk about research, where research takes place, it's essential that we're addressing this hierarchy that exists and that we're bringing in people who use drugs. And in this case, women who use drugs in as researchers, um, that we we recognize these critical dimensions and that we, we working towards this comprehensive and equitable approach that we have to then bring them in, in this new knowledge, um, rather than um, us walking in and saying, oh, we, we then studying, surveying, collecting all the data, and then we producing it as, as, as sound, sound knowledge and, and we are the experts. Um, so there's a lot of paradigm shift and even our mentality has to change um, and our philosophies. And, and we, we will have to examine that, um, our personal narratives and what's, what is influencing that a lot. Um, Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, I know I'm getting messages about time. I'm so sorry. But if I can ask our speakers to also, if you can, answer some of the questions that are still left in the chat. I do see someone asked us for online trainings. And there is actually an amazing online training um, that uh, Ernst Weiss, uh, do you guys remember the name? Maybe Suchi and Paulina you guys will remember the name of that training. We can maybe put that link in um, in in the chat so people can see it. But I also just wanted to mention one other thing that you know. Now we're talking about a few of the issues, and one of the things we don't ever or hardly ever talk about are women who use drugs who are pregnant. You know, for example, there's so much evidence to show that a lot of that propaganda we heard about especially from the United States about, you know, the, the terminology used was crack babies and things like that. It created so much stigma and discrimination, but it was also then um, used to create policies really to control and oppress, for example, Black American women. 
Um, and then that was sent around the world. And so it's something that we need to think about. Jules, do you mind just talking a little bit about the toolkit for pregnant women so that people know about it? Yeah, sure. So I was really uh, lucky, thanks to uh, work from Sanford and uh, funding from Elton John AIDS Foundation. And we have just uh, finished uh, developing a toolkit specifically for healthcare workers who are um, working with pregnant women who use drugs. It's an evidence-based informed document. It is endorsed by the Academy of Perinatal Harm Reduction. It is endorsed by Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, and it is very straightforward. Uh, it is based on African context, but it can be you know, utilized more broadly, but specifically to help guide our healthcare workers, our community healthcare workers, our nurses and doctors, on how to work more effectively and what is the actual um, evidence, what is the kind of correct information we should be sharing. Um, we will be launching it officially on a webinar on the 28th of August. So the invitations will be coming out shortly and, and I will speak to Colleen and HRI again, if I can perhaps circulate it through the same email systems as we did for this. Um, and yeah, it would, it would be wonderful to have people join and I will be more than happy then to share e-versions of the toolkit so we can get it out there in Africa. Thanks, thanks Colleen for allowing that. I know it's something Daniela brought up in her research as well. So we definitely do need to be sharing this information in South Africa, thanks, or in Africa, thanks. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, Julie and um, I would love to be able to continue this conversation. I feel like we're just starting and now we have to stop because of our time, however, what I would encourage you to do is we have set up a WhatsApp group. If you would like to be part of the, that WhatsApp group, can you please send an email to with your phone number to this address, which, um, which I'm putting into the chat uh, to join the WhatsApp group and um, where you will be able to share information and talk about things. Um, it's office at hri.global. Send your phone number there and we will be able to um, include you in that WhatsApp group and be able to, for all of you to be able to share a lot of these, this information. I think the, the things that have really stood out for me is the fact that we need to be talking about this now and quite vocally because we do have some harm reduction in, in Africa, but really it's an emerging area. And so if we can get it right now, at the beginning, we won't be implementing services where people don't want to go or we're losing people to follow up um, or we're, we're having services that are inappropriate being delivered. And I think that, you know, one of the things Daniela talked about is the limited data. And that's one area we have to start getting right, because when you have good data, you are able to have a good budget and you are able to have scaled up programming that is appropriate. When you don't have good data, you guess at how much money you can put in, you guess at how many people you need to be able to reach, and then we fail on every level in terms of that program. And then we say, why did we put money in there? It didn't work anyway. But it's because we didn't do the groundwork to begin with. And so I think that's one area that we really need to start looking at a lot more. The other is you know, that that issue around loss to follow up and why people don't want to go to services. It's about stigma and discrimination, but it's about our communities. And we have to move away from that global north perspective of individuals. That's capitalism, right? And quite frankly, it has not worked for any of us. Um, it, it makes you focus on the individual and it does not take into account that we live in communities. We are part of communities and it is our communities that give us a lot of our support. It's also our communities that can be our biggest barrier a lot of the times. So how are we engaging our communities and moving away from that? It's all about you as an individual. Um, yes, it is about me as an individual, but it's about me, Colleen, who also lives in, where do I, I'm in Tower Hamlets in London, right? And I think that's part of something that we have to really think about moving forward because we can address things like stigma and discrimination and loss to follow up and all those other things with a community approach. And we've seen that with COSUP. Um, I think one of the things that really struck me when Aura, while you were presenting and, and Daniela and Dima as well, is you were all talking about radical tenderness. And I've never seen that in a presentation until I saw ours today, 
radical tenderness. And I think that really needs to underpin what we are doing um, here today and where we want to move in the future. Because when someone is going through a challenge, it means that they are not being approached in a manner that has any tender, uh, a tenderness. And so I would love for us to be able to look at how we can do that, um, how we can convince donors and our governments that actually tenderness is critical to making a program successful um, because it is about providing that confidence that Karen was talking about, being able to get out in her community, being able to go into the farms and do some work because she's had this, um, a, this introduction to a program that actually said you are important and we value you and you also are valued in the community. And I think those are some of the things that we really need to start coming through in our programming to make it work. Um, I think another piece was radical activism of care, which Aura, I saw you put that in, but you were all, all of our speakers today were really talking about that radical activism of care and really, you know, trying to change that. So when Daniela was talking about people who, you know, tools that are out there that actually make no sense, or Aura was talking about tools that are out there and papers that are out there that we don't understand because they are not tailored for us. And so it's really about how do we have this activism of care where we're saying, I'm also going to speak in your language. Um, and it's we're so sorry we couldn't have translation on today's uh, webinar, but we're hoping that in the future when we have more of these regional webinars, we would be able to have some interpretation in appropriate languages. But I think on that note, I'd like to leave it there and say thank you all so very much to the hundreds of people who joined us today on this webinar. It will be available on HRI's website as well as the website of our partner organizations, but um, you'll receive something uh, through an email um, once the, 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 the session is over. So I say let's talk about and think about radical tenderness, radical activism, radical care, and a community approach. And hopefully we can have some success in implementing good harm reduction in our region. Thank you all so very much. Thank you to our amazing speakers. And I hope that we see you all soon.